what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about winning phone sales strategies that work, okay? The first part of this is going to talk a lot about the process of telephone sales. Really, like anything, like any sort of uh, winning formulas, there's, a, there's always a process or a system to selling, okay? And selling face-to-face, -face, selling over the internet, selling via the phone, they all have different systems. So today I'm going to share with you a system. This is not the only system, it's a system for selling over the phone. And it breaks it down into modules. The first module is pre-call planning, second is pre-decision maker conversation, third is interest creating opening, fourth is questions, fifth is recommendation, sixth is commitment, and then the last is setting up the next action. Hopefully that next action is winning some business. Pre-call planning. This is, this is something that I didn't really want to just skim over. It's relatively short, but it's really important that when you start your day, you set up the objective for the day, right? You know, a lot of people, I see a lot of people throughout my career that, you know, they show up at, at start time is 8 o'clock, they show up at 8.03, and, you know, and they, you know, they're either late for a meeting or they, they're rushing to get things going. They don't plan their day properly. And, and, you know, so putting that objective together for the day, which, which really consists of things like putting your to-do list together, right? Just simple stuff like that. Putting your, uh, putting your call list together, your actions, the follow-ups, those sorts of things. Setting, that, setting your day up before you start your day will make your day immeasurably smoother, okay? I've gotten in a habit over the years of setting up my day the night before. So what I do is I leave, before I leave, I put my to-do list and my things to do on a piece of paper before I leave. And then what happens is I come into that piece of paper in the morning and then I recategorize them based upon where my mind is at that point, reprioritize them, cross the ones off that I know I'm not gonna do, delegate the ones that I don't wanna do, and go ahead and start doing the things I need to do. Okay, so I don't want to skip over that because that's really important because I see, you know, I know that a lot of people here are maybe do some of that, but maybe not everybody. I think it's a really important part of, of, uh, of your pre-call pre planning and your setting up your day is really important. The second part of that is <laughs> prepare, it may seem trivial, but prepare your work area, right? If you, if you have a desk that looks like a tornado hit it or you know there's more food remnants on your desk than there are you know uh, pieces of paper or or computer hardware then you know it's probably not a good sign right so getting your work area organized because one of the things is is that when you're in the middle of a call or trying to make a call you got all these distractions going on you when you're when you're in the middle of a sales call it's like me right now in the middle of this presentation trying to field calls send texts and answer the door while I'm trying to do this it doesn't work because in reality a sales call is like a presentation it's like a conversation okay so you know getting your work area set up and organized will immensely benefit you it's very simple but you know pay attention to it I think you'll see I think you'll see some good returns on it last is uh, prepare your mind this is one that that uh, very few people do okay very few people even the people that set their objectives and organize their work area a lot of them don't prepare themselves mentally right for what's gonna happen because we're in sales guys what's gonna happen what's the number one thing that you know is gonna happen to you in sales anybody blurt it out rejection, rejection. Right? I mean, it, it happens. It's all day long. That's the life we lead. That's the world we live in, right? We chose this profession. So we got to be prepared mentally. So, what does that mean to be prepared mentally? Number one, you got to leave all the baggage at the door, right? When you come in, you know, your sick kid, listen, I know it's hard to focus when your son or daughter is sick. I, I have two daughters, I, I can relate. I know when maybe you had a little spat with your spouse how that can affect you. Uh, I know how when things are tight financially or when it's around the holiday season or health issues or any number of things, 
how they can affect you. But what you got to do is you really got to, the number one thing is you got to try to leave all that stuff at the door. And hopefully you have family that understands that. And if you don't, you got to have a sit down with them and you got to have a, a real discussion. You got to talk to them about it. You got to say, listen, um, I love you. I'm here for you. But when I'm at work, I'm at work. And I have to do my job because if I don't do my job, then the whole house of cards comes tumbling down. So, you know, you got to prepare yourself mentally. So number one, you got to leave the baggage at the door. Number two, you got to prepare yourself for the rejection that you're going to get, okay? Um, some of the rejection is very nice and tactful, and some of the rejection isn't so nice and tactful. You will get people that will uh, be none too happy that you're cold calling them, okay? And hopefully, with some of the techniques I'm going to share with you today, you get less of that because you're going to come in. A, you're going to have a little bit more engaging style. Um, you're going to have a little bit more fun, and I think the people you're going to be able to differentiate yourself a little bit from the typical freight broker that's out there hustling freight. Okay, at least that's my goal. You'll let me know at the end of the day if that actually happens. All right. So prepare yourself at the beginning of the day, but then. You know, the second thing you got to do is you got to prepare for before each call. You know, boy, this is a lot of work, isn't it? You know, we just got started and I've already, you know, I've already got you doing way too much work here. But you be prepare at the beginning of the day, but you have to prepare for every call. One of the things that we've covered in a previous seminar and in different sales trainings that we've done is about, do, about sales intelligence and about doing research on your prospects prior to actually calling them. So doing your online or offline research on websites, you know, if you're calling a company, you, you know, doesn't it make sense that you would look on their website and try to see what products they sell? Doesn't it make sense that you would want to know the CEO or the vice president of operations or any upper management's names so that you could maybe drop them in the conversation? Doesn't it make sense that you would want to know a recent press release where they talked about acquiring another company or releasing a new product line or opening a new location? And these are all simple things. And those, that information is, you, it's becoming more readily and readily available because websites are, have a, they are getting better and better. Um, and so you'll find a lot of that information on the website. What you don't find on the website, you'll find in search engines, Google, right? Google is one of my best friends. As sad as that sounds, there's very little that I ever want to know that I can't ask Google and it won't give me the answer if you know how to search. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time today on gathering sales intelligence because that's a whole training piece on its own. Okay, And we've already covered some of that. If anybody has any interest in that, see me afterwards. I can point you in the right direction. Okay. And lastly, you know, your database, if you have a CRM or a folder, some sort of information repository that you use during your prospecting or your account management, you, know, you got to go to those things. You got to look at them. You got to refresh yourself. What did I have? Isn't it great to be able to go back to a CRM or some sort of information database and say, you know, I talked to this guy 90 days ago and this is the conversation we had at the time his son was playing in the world, in the Little League World Series. And wouldn't that be a great topic to talk about? Um, or that any, any nuggets of information or refreshing the conversation because they were having challenge with, with X, Y, and Z. And you know, go back to those tools and utilize those tools for part of your pre-call planning. Now, a lot of this sounds very rudimentary, right? Very basic. Well, I hate to tell you guys, but most salespeople don't do it and even more brokers don't, okay? So, in my experience, okay? Secondly, um, you should set a primary objective, okay? And the primary objective is, what do I want them to do? Okay, what do I want them to do? Not think, feel, or believe. What do I want them to do as a result of this call? And what will I be doing? The goal, right is something actionable right it's something actionable it's not soft okay it's got to be actionable secondly you want to focus on objectives that are action oriented which is kind of what i just touched on so 
When you want to set a primary objective for a call, you got to ask yourself before that call, what exactly do I want to happen after this call? Because remember, if this is a first call, uh, you know, an introductory call, your objective is very different than if it's a, you've been talking to this guy on and off for six months. But you still need an objective. Because, and, and in most cases, what I see is I see people that in early calls, particularly introductory calls, they'll have some sort of an objective. Their objective is not very well defined. It's to build a little rapport and gather a little information. Weak, but better than nothing. Where I see a lack of focus is on follow-up calls. One of the things that drives me absolutely crazy is when people call up and say, hey, just call on to touch base, see how things are going. Come on, guys. I mean, that, that's your way. You immediately just told him that you're there to waste his time or her time. You got to be better than that. You got to be smarter than that. There's better ways to do it, okay? So setting your primary objective on every call, no matter where that call is in the process. First call to you know commitment call or closing calls, okay? Whether you've known them for 15 minutes or 15 years, you have to have an objective on those sales calls, all right? So pre-call planning, weak objective. I talked about that a little bit. Introduce myself and see if there's any interest. Better than nothing, but still weak. A little bit better. Define the prospect's current challenges or pain points and get them to send me current bid or lane package. See how it's actionable? They're going to send me something. It's defined. It's not significantly different, but it's significantly better. Okay? That's an example. Second one, follow up and see if they'd be interested in seeing a proposal. Better than nothing, but weak. Weak. Not actionable right so a little bit better is to generate interest and get them to agree to review a proposal in consideration of your future order the action on that is get them to agree they're gonna say yes I'm gonna do this or no I'm not okay so those are examples of setting objectives right I'm not gonna spend an enormous amount of time on that but it is really important before every call based upon what information you gathered and can review in advance of the call setting some sort of a clear and defined objective okay so we were talking about rejection earlier right and rejection affects people in different ways okay some people it rolls right off their back other people uh, you know they take things very personally and it affects their the next call and the next call and the next call okay um, other people you know it's flavor of the day you don't know what you're gonna get right one way to set yourself up so that you're not feeling maybe quite as rejective is to set a secondary objective and this has, there's a lot of value to this and the secondary objective is something as simple as is getting them to agree that they will this is what you'll accomplish at a minimum level. So the secondary objective is what you're going to accomplish at a minimum level, right? What's my absolute fallback? If they don't agree to what I'm proposing or that I get my primary objective done, what's my fallback plan, right? And so your fallback can be something as simple as to, to agree to take your call in 90 days to determine if there's any opportunities at that time. You know, getting them to say, yeah, call me, no problem. Call me in 90 days, we'll have that conversation. So it does two things number one um, it sets you up so that you have a future opportunity a possible opportunity and number two you know it really will change your mindset a little bit when you come off that call it's you know you could it could be a he rejected me and oh woe is me or B he rejected me but he agreed to talk to me again okay so there is a difference there is a difference there okay uh, next Pre-decision maker conversations. This is um, this is a, a very very tricky topic, okay, and one that we're going to spend a little bit of time on. There's different approaches here. You have the people who will be evasive and lie and try to figure out ways around the gatekeepers, and then you have people that are a little bit more forward, you know, and will. Be a little more strategic okay 
So we're going to talk a little bit about how this works. So number one, you know, when you're trying to get around a gatekeeper, whether it be a secretary or someone within the department or someone answer the phone, whatever it is, you know, the basics. Identify yourself and your company. The most important thing that I found that works is to ask for help. Just ask for help. Hey, can you help me out? I'm hoping you can help me. There's a few things here, a few phrases that you can use that I've used and that I, I really like. Uh, you know, I was wondering if you can help me out. I use that a lot. People will have a tendency to want to help if you ask for it, right? They're going to be a lot more, give you a lot more information and be a lot more um, cooperative if you ask them for help than if they think that you're trying to sneak something by them, right? And so that's one of the things you got to take into consideration. So, you know, ask for the name of the person who handles logistics and transportation or shipping or whatever department or category or label you want to put on it. But you want to know the name. You don't necessarily want to be transferred to that person, right? The mistake that I see a lot of people do is they'll say, hi, can I speak with the person in charge of shipping? Well, what might happen if you ask for that? You get the well, they, get you, they transfer you, right? And well, what happens if the guy picks up the phone and says, hello? Well, now you look like a real dummy, don't you? You, don't, you can't address the guy by name. You're going to have to ask him, oh, hey, can I talk to whoever's in charge of shipping? Ding, ding, ding. Wow, I don't want to talk to this guy or this girl, right? So this is where that sales intelligence comes in, right? So, you know, before, you, you know, a, a phrase that you can use or a strategy that you can use with those gatekeepers is you can say, before you transfer me, I'd like to get the name of the person who handles such and such. Before you transfer me, give me that name. Then you want to make a mental note of that. You may not even, you know, there's times when you may not even want to talk to that person right now, but you want the name of that person because then maybe you're going to go try to find their email or look some information up about them on LinkedIn and then you're going to call them back, right? So there's times when having that information can be extremely valuable that you don't necessarily want to talk to them. And that's a real simple strategy for doing it, okay? Here's a section that we're going to talk about. It's called screener and voicemail tips, right? There's always this big debate. Do I leave a voicemail? Do I not leave a voicemail? How many voicemails do I leave? What do I say? How long should it be? Um, and, you know, to me, you know, I don't think there's, there's no perfect answer to it. There's no... You're not going to, FYI, you're not going to come out of this with some message that I'm going to give you that's going to work all the time. It's just, they're just, it doesn't exist, right? You know, if you want somebody to call you back, you tell them you're an IRS agent. I don't know how happy they're going to be, okay? But at the end of the day, you know, you, you, you know you'll get the call back. I just don't think it's, you're gonna, they're going to be happy about it. So, you know, one of the things is... Uh, don't get lost in the phone system Bermuda Triangle. Has anybody ever got caught in the phone system Bermuda Triangle? Raise your hand. Well, that's why it's up here, because it happens to everybody. When you call into large organizations, typically, you know, you'll talk to somebody, and because they've got a whole bunch of calls going on, um, they want to just transfer you as quickly as possible. It doesn't necessarily mean they want to pitch you to the right location. They just want to get you off their phone so they can move on to the next call and the next call and whatever else they have going on. So if during that process you notice that maybe they don't quite understand where you want to be, ask questions. Don't get transferred and transferred and transferred again. Waste your time. Um, you know, one of the keys that, uh, you know, as a sales manager in the past and just a business owner that, that I've struggled with is getting people to ask for the highest level decision maker in the organization as it relates to the products that they sell. Most salespeople want to start down here and work their way up. It's hard. You're, you're, you're making your job much harder. The goal is to start as high as you can. So if you work your way from the top down, even if that's not the person and they don't necessarily want to talk to you, you can get transferred. Like perfect example here, I was speaking with Karen from Mr. Jones' office and she felt that Mr. Smith would be the correct contact for me to talk to or speak with, okay? So what I said before, do not lie or imply that Mr. Jones said anything about you 
wanting or should buy from him. Don't, don't lie about it. Don't over exaggerate it. Don't embellish. You know, getting transferred from there uh, should be enough to get people's attention. One of the things I used to do all the time, all the time, I made a living on this, was rather than almost every phone system, you can see where the calls are being transferred from, right? You, you know the person or the office or the department, you can see it. So one of the things I used to do was I would call one of the executives, either a VP or a CEO or whoever, somebody that I could get their extension or their name or get to their, get to their office. And then when I got to them, I would say, oh, they sent me to the wrong extension. I'm sorry. Can you transfer me to Joe in logistics or Joe in transportation? And then that call would come down from, from the CEO's office or the VP's office, and they would see it come in. And they, so, they're, so they're typically going to answer the phone, and at that point they would pick up the phone and, and wouldn't necessarily be the CEO, but at least I would get them on the phone. Now, I didn't do that in early calls. I did that when I couldn't get people on the phone. So I didn't do that. That wasn't a common practice. It was only when my normal course of routine or my strategy wasn't working okay so that's just a little tip that you might employ when you're when uh, when you're struggling to get somebody on the phone that you really want to get on the phone okay but be prepared to dance at that point because their their expectations are a little higher and uh, than just the average call yeah yeah a few other things uh, tips you know, another great tip is go to other departments. You know, I was just giving you my example of going to an executive's office, coming down from an executive suite or a C-level or a president or a VP of sales. Go to another department. This works particularly well when the screener is not authorized to give out names. You ever call a company and ask who the transportation manager is and they say, well, we can't, our poly, we can't give out names. If you don't know the person's name, I can't even transfer you. I've, I've called companies that said that. If you don't know the contact's name, I can't send you to a department. I can only get, if you know their extension or you know their name, I'll transfer you. Now, I think that's, I don't think that's very good customer service as a company policy, but I don't control their policy. So all we have to do is, remember, it's chess, it's not checkers, right? We got to work around it. We got to figure out a way to win. So um, one way that wins is getting, they'll almost always transfer you to the sales department. Why? Well, they think you're going to buy something, right? So get transferred to the sales department. Ask for somebody in sales. They're almost always willing to talk to you. Matter of fact, if you want to talk to somebody that, you know, and you're bored, just call the sales department at almost any company. They'll, they'll be glad to puke all over you about all their products and all the crap that they have to offer, okay? Um, and the way to do that is, you know, say something like, hey, I hope you can help me. I'm not in the right department and hopefully you can point me in the right direction. I'm Joe with such and such. You know, I'm looking for the name of the person that manages your logistics or shipping. Salespeople will almost always give that to you, okay? They'll almost always give you that information. And if you ask more questions, okay, in the right way and you phrase the questions the right way, not like a military tribunal, but build them into a conversation, you will get a lot of sales intelligence and a lot of information about that person prior to the call, which could be very beneficial. How long they've been in the company? Are they really the decision maker? Um, you know, hobbies, things, you know, things about them that you'd be surprised that you can get that information. Do you think any of that could be valuable when you get on the phone with somebody for the first time and you're trying to make a good impression? Huge, absolutely huge. See me, I would never call them after I got the name. I would immediately go to LinkedIn and I would find them on LinkedIn. If I didn't find them on LinkedIn, I'd try to find them somewhere else online. And I would do, any of you, and I've been on sales calls with many of you um, at different, for different reasons in different times. And one of the first things I do when you tell me who the person is, is I go to two places. Where do I go? Dana, where do I go when you, when you and I do a sales call together? Where are the two places I go? LinkedIn and Google. And number three is yeah. our database. Yeah. 
I, I never even consider making that phone call, getting on that phone call, or doing anything with that phone call until I review all those notes and all that information. Okay? So I suggest you do the same thing. So gathering that sales intelligence from another department can really help you get through those screeners because once you know that person's name, now you can ask for them by name. You can also get their extension. And a lot of times they'll even give you your email, their email address. Okay? Um, another tip that you know that you don't that is a little or a little different is listen to the entire voicemail. If you go to somebody's voicemail, okay, and you keep getting somebody's voicemail time over time over time, and you can't get them on the phone, listen to the whole voicemail because sometimes that voicemail can contain nuggets, particularly if it changes. They might talk about the fact that they're on vacation. They may, which could be helpful, right? Knowing when they get back, they were on vacation. Might talk about them be working from another location. Might talk about them working from home today. Might talk about, it might even give you another phone number to contact them at. It might give you an email address. It give you a number of things. So something simple like that, don't just hang up on the voicemail. Listen to the voicemail all the way through because sometimes there's nuggets in there. Not, a, not always, but sometimes there's nuggets. Uh, next, you gotta be prepared, be prepared for leaving a voicemail. Face it, you know, it's the world we live in. People hide behind voicemail. You're gonna get voicemail a lot, okay? So you've gotta be prepared to leave a voicemail, all right? And what I mean by, I don't mean just leave a voicemail. I mean, you gotta, you gotta sound interesting. I mean, you can't be a robot, you know? You've gotta sound compelling. You got to sound as though you would want somebody to sound like if they left you a voicemail. Would you call yourself back? And in the majority of the cases, the answer is no. The answer is no. Because you've never really listened. It's really funny because, <clears throat> because some salespeople that don't, they talk different when a voicemail picks up than when they do when somebody picks up the phone. I don't understand it. It's like a psyche for some reason. I don't know. All automatically, when that voicemail picks up, they go into robot mode. And they sound like a robot. But when they'll talk to somebody on the phone, they'll be very dynamic. I don't know why. It's just I've noticed that over the years that sometimes it's like, that, it's like they hear that message and it sounds monotone. So all of a sudden, they get monotone and, and, they, you know, and they're just real blah about it. It's not compelling. It's not interesting. You know, you're, if you're going to leave a voicemail, it has to be compelling. It has to be like a compelling opening, which we're going to talk a little bit about, okay? Um, and worst case scenario, don't leave a voicemail if you're not prepared. Just hang up the phone. It's better to hang up, gather your thoughts, put, you know, put your mind, you know, get a little organized, and then call back and leave a voicemail than it is to leave a voicemail that nobody would return or nobody wants to listen to. Right? Uh, you know, another thing I, told, I talked about this a little bit earlier. If a screener asks you questions, you're better off, honestly, just answering the questions and don't be evasive. You're going to get a lot more cooperation from them. I can tell you that people that are paid to screen and to filter phone calls for their organization would catch a lot of crap when they let calls go through that shouldn't have went through. So they get pretty upset when, when somebody tries to sneak through. You usually will get a lot more cooperation just telling them the truth and, you know, and building a little bit of rapport with them and giving, a, giving a, them a compelling reason. You're gonna get a lot further. You're just gonna go a lot further. So you know, something like, let me explain why I'm calling. We work with companies such as yours to help them save money on their logistics. I, you know, you're, you're doing whatever you could to try to get her to say, you're sa hey, I know my company wants to save money. Um, I know logistics is always one of those problem areas that we have. Guy seems like a guy or girl seems nice. You know, they're not trying to get around me. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll give them a little bit of information. Maybe I'll help them out. You know, and then I'll, obviously asking for help is always the critical part. That's how we started. So a few more things, and then we're going to wrap up this piece. Um, Another tactic that 
is very simple, but most people don't do, and that I found has worked really, really well. When you leave a voicemail, leave a live message with a, with a secretary as well. So you leave a voicemail, okay, and you, you have a real compelling and good voicemail message, right? Maybe it's a follow-up conversation and there's, you, you, you have some good sales intelligence on what you were going to talk about on that call. It's sometimes hard with a first call, right? Um, because you don't have a lot of information, so it's hard to put a compelling statement together. But maybe it's a follow-up call and you've got some really good information, some really good feedback, some really good ideas, some really something meaty that you want to share with them and you leave a good voicemail message and then rather than just leaving it on the voicemail, you call and leave it with a live person as well, if you can. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. And you leave the voicemail saying um, something like, hey, I left a detailed message for Mr. Jones about how he could do this or uh, a couple of ideas that I had that I wanted to share with him on, on, that I thought might help. Right? So in addition to just leaving the voicemail, leave a, an actual physical message as well. Okay? Pretty simple, but um, sometimes it's the difference between getting that call re returned or not. Now, this is a strategy that I've never used, okay? But uh, is a strategy that I thought was really interesting. I read an article a while back about a guy that did this, a salesperson that started doing this strategy, which was what you read here. Dear Mr. Prospect, my name is Tom Smith, and I work for a company called Logistic Dynamics on May 15th. I spoke, this is an email by the way, okay? I spoke with Jennifer and, uh, Jennifer and she suggested I speak with you regarding what we do here. I tried to contact you on four separate occasions, so on and so forth. The reason for this email is I'm concerned that I've done something wrong and, this, and that this is the reason why you're not returning my calls. Hence the title of the email, Advanced Apologies. If I've done something wrong, I'd like to find out so I can correct it. If you'd like to talk to me, please give me a call or email me at. Now the feedback on this article, and again, I've never deployed this, but I thought it was interesting because you really got two choices. You can just keep pounding that voicemail and pounding that voicemail and pounding that voicemail and try to catch them right at the right time, which we all know can be difficult and painful and you know not so fun. Or we could take a little bit different strategy. I didn't see anything wrong with this. I thought this was an inter. Now, would I do this all the time? No. But if this were someone that I really wanted to get in touch with, where I thought I had a, a good level of engagement with them prior to that, and for whatever reason I can't get them on the phone, I would do this. I would use this. I would give it a try. Is it going to work 100% of the time? No. But if it worked 30% of the time, it took one email. You're not going to send this email more than once. You send this once. That's it. So if you, if you improved your odds by 20 or 30 percent, that can mean a lot of money in the, in the sales game. A lot of money. Okay? So that was just an interesting idea that, uh, that I wanted to, in, in to, to incorporate. Anybody? Have you know what? I don't think it'll work all the time. I do think it'll work a small percentage of the time. You'll compel to some people and say, oh, you know, I feel really bad. You know, I, I, I'm going to at least give this guy a call back. Now, I'm not saying that the end, net end result is going to be any different, but you know, you got to be in it to win it. And what I mean by in it, you got to be talking. You got to have some level of conversation going in order to get anywhere, right? So I think it's an interesting tactic. I think it might work. And again, you can customize this any way you want, right? It doesn't have to be that. That's just an example. All right. So here, here's, a, here's a really important here's a really important piece of the equation when you're talking about selling over the phone. You know, up to this point, it's all been about trying to get people on the phone, right? And we've spent the last, what, half an hour, 45 minutes talking about strategies on how to get people on the phone. That, that's a big struggle. Now what do you do when you got them there, right? Well, <clears throat> most people um, don't do a very good job. So we're, gonna, we're going to try to improve on that a little bit, all right? So first, these are the things that I want you to avoid and never say, please, okay? And the reason why I want you to avoid and never say them is because this is what all amateur salespeople say. 
And if you want to sound like an amateur, and you want to sound like every other salesperson that calls these people, and you don't want to differentiate yourself, say what's up on this screen right now, okay? It's a surefire way to get a ton of rejection and to just put yourself into the crowd of every Joe Schmuck salesperson, okay? So things like, I'm calling to check in with you, I'm just calling to check in with you, or just wanted to touch base with you, or wanted to see if there's anything you need. That's not a horrible one, but I still think that there's a lot better ways to have an opening statement. Calling to see if you received my information. Come on, guys, please. Please don't ever do that. I mean, spend five minutes figuring something out better to say than that. That can never, ever be your opening, okay? <laughs> never let that be your opening. Before you have that opening, call me and I will personally help you develop an opening, okay? Before you use any of these openings, all right? I wanted to introduce my company to you. Wah, 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 wah. They don't care, okay? Like to set up a time to get together. Well, that's a little presumptuous. The problem with that is, is that's a little presumptuous. You call me up and say that, and I'm saying, who are you? You haven't earned my time, seriously. And, and I'm a little jaded because I get a lot of sales calls. So I get inundated with salespeople calling me all the time. And any of you that have been in my office when I've taken one of those calls, I'm not a very nice guy. <laughs> Okay? And I'm not because, you know, that's, I have to be that way. And just so you know, I can relate to the person on the other end, um, you know, in regards to their frustration with talking to salespeople. I get crushed and they all sound the same. And then about one out of 50, I'll say, I mean, just rough numbers, I mean, not very often. About one out of 50 will catch me with something interesting at the right time and I'll actually talk to them. And, I, and the problem is, is that when I talk to them, I end up buying it. That's the problem. That's why I don't like to talk to salespeople. I'm just a natural buyer. I want to buy stuff. It's, I don't know. I don't want to be sold, but I love to buy. So if you ever want to sell anything to me, just get through the first five minutes of your spiel and if I'm still listening to you, I'm probably going to buy, okay? So that's just a note to self, all right? But these are all opening statements that I, I want you to avoid like the plague. Please try not to use these, okay? So on the first half of this, uh, on the first, let's call it the first third of this, okay, training, we covered uh, some of the key components which were, uh, well, actually, it's far, it's far too many. We talked about how to get in the door. We talked about being prepared. We talked about tips for getting past screeners and voicemails. And now what we're going to do is we're going to get into a little bit more meat and potatoes. And one of the more critical components of it where we left off was what not to do in your opening statements. Okay? So we talked a little bit about that. Now we're going to talk about, you know, opening rules, tips, and ideas. Ideas on how to do the, a proper opening statement, all right? So when you're doing an opening, when you're doing a, an opening of any call, and this isn't just an opening of a cold call or a first call, this is an opening of every call in the process, okay? You need to think about your opening for every single call throughout the entire sales process. Okay, and you should be customizing that call to every person in every circumstance that you're dealing with. Okay, there's only two primary objectives. Number one is to put them in a positive frame of mind. Okay, you want them to be positive about the information and about the fact that they're going to invest at least five or ten minutes with you. You want them to feel good about that. Okay, and secondly, you want to move them on to the questioning part of the call, okay? So that's all you're trying to do in the introduction, all right? If this is a follow-up call, you're gonna bridge this call from the previous follow-up call, right? So you're gonna say something like, calling to continue our conversation, 
I'd like to pick up where we left off. You know, it's a continuation call, so you're going to have to customize that on your follow-up calls. Um, and then if it is a follow-up call, you're going to remind them of their interest where we discussed such and such topic or challenge or problem or idea. Okay, so you want to remind them because sometimes it's not the next day. Most times it's not the next day. Most times it's the next week or it's two weeks or it's three weeks. Anybody ever had prospects that they thought were really interested and next thing you know it's a month later you haven't talked to them again? They fielded a lot of calls. A lot of waters went under the bridge during that time. If you don't bridge that call very well in the opening, to them it's just another cold call. So you've got you've to bridge that. Okay, and that's very important that you're able to do that. All right, so uh, one of the critical things that, that I see salespeople where they lack is, you know, having value-added points on every call. You know, they have a tendency to get in this mode where, you know, their first call sounds like this, and their second call sounds like this, and their third call sounds like this, and it becomes very rudimentary and very uh, robotic, we'll call it. Um, you need to come up with value on, your goal is to come up with value on every single call. If you don't, you're taking a chance that they're, gonna sh they're just going to close the door on you, okay? You know, I equate sales, whether it be over the phone or face-to-face, -face, like a football game, right? You kick it off they, and you field it on, let's call it, say you're on the 10-yard line when you get the ball. And on your first call, your goal is to get to the 30. If you get to the 30 on that first call, it was successful. The next call, you got to get it to the 50. If you don't bridge the call very well, you might be starting on the 12-yard line. If you bridge it really well, like I talked about, you might be on the 25 and now you can pick up a little momentum, get to the 45 or 50, and the next call and so on and so forth. The hardest part of football is what? Not the kickoff return, not between the 30 and the 30, it's inside the 20, right? That's the hardest part in sales too, okay? So, you know, this is, a, you know, this opening is really critical and, and, when I, and a lot of people relate this opening to just, oh, this is my cold call opening or this is my introductory opening on an introductory call. No. Every single call you need to think about what your opening is and you need to add and provide value. Okay? So examples of providing value. Be prepared with useful news and ideas and information and how some of your, on how some of your customers are taking full advantage of all the things you have to offer. I gave a perfect example. I was talking to one of my customers yesterday and I thought of you, right? That's a great segue, right? One of my new customers was very excited about our customer portal and I didn't think we covered that in our last call, did we? You know, integrate in some of the, some of the benefits, in, you can integrate that into the openings, okay? Of the, a particular of a follow-up call, obviously, not necessarily an introductory call, all right? Um, be proactive, you know, even if you did send the literature, the pricing, don't ask if they received it. Just make the assumption that they received it and read it. If they didn't, they'll tell you. And what you need to be ready to do is you need to be ready. What I always did was this, because I always knew that their out was, well, I didn't have time to review the information, or I didn't get the email. I had it all ready to send, resend to them right there, because I know they're in front of their computer. Oh, great, I'm going to send it to you right now. And before it even, before, as soon as they said it, before it even, before they even said, oh, it was dinging on their computer, and sometimes I could even hear it, the Outlook message come up, ding, there it is. So it was right there in front of them. So now there's no excuses why we can't spend five minutes going over it now. It's short anyway, just give me five minutes. Because I want to, I mean, I, I want to talk to them about it. I don't want to take a chance on waiting another three days or five days or weeks or months before we get a chance to talk about it, okay? So be proactive. They're going to tell you if they don't have time. Don't worry, they'll tell you. Um, but if you add value, if you lead with value, you're more likely to get time. If you don't lead with value, 
I guarantee you, you're going to get very little time and you're going to be on the clock. You got 60 seconds. Time's up. Okay? So, um, you know, things like I'd like to review the rate proposal I sent you via email. Use words like discuss or analyze or go through. If they wouldn't have it, if they don't have it handy, no problem. Be prepared to send it to them. A few more tips. This is an interesting idea. I, I, I understand, I, I read another article recently, and they used the term weasel words. And I, I thought that was, I wasn't quite sure how to take that, right? But when, then they put it into context, and the context was, have you ever had a salesperson, or have you ever, as the salesperson, called up one of your prospects and said, I can show you how to do this, that, and the other thing, guaranteed. Anybody ever received or taken, given a call like that? Yeah. What's the first thing you think about when that guy or girl, well, as soon as you get a chance to pause? I don't want to talk to this guy. He's a bullshitter. I don't. I just, I, my first thing comes out of my mouth. I'm like, I don't need, I don't need this right now. Right? Because they're, they're overstating themselves. They're overselling themselves. They think that that's what I want to hear. It's not what I want to hear. I don't want to hear guaranteed. You don't even know me. How do you, you don't know my problems. You don't know my business. You don't know my budget. You don't know my, you don't even know if I'm the decision maker for Christ's sakes. Okay? So, you know, people that lead like that, I'm not a big believer in it. And I'm a, and I'm a guy that leads with his chin when he sells. I, I hang it out there, right? I get hit sometimes. I just have a tendency to win more than I lose. So, so what, he meant, what they meant by weasel language was things like, I might be able to, or there's a possibility, or depending upon what you're doing now. You know? So you're, you're, leaving, you're giving them an honest assessment that you know, I really may be able to help you. There's no guarantees. I even say there's no guarantees, but it doesn't hurt to look. More information about this definitely isn't going to hurt you so that you can make a smart decision. Okay? Uh, one of the last tips we're going to talk about here is tease them with results. Okay? People pay for results. They don't pay for features and benefits. Okay? I hate to break the news to you, but if you're spending all your time talking about features and benefits of LDI and LDI and this and that and, you know, I can, I can guarantee you, you lead a very frustrating, frustrated existence and maybe not nearly as profitable as it could be if you start focusing more on results. So bottom line, the only reason why people will consider listening to you is if they feel you might have something that's going to help them get something that they want or help them avoid something they don't want. Now that's a very powerful statement. You got to think about that. All right. The only reason people, anyone is going to consider listening to you, listening to you, not buying from you. Remember, we're not even to the buying stage. Okay, we're not even there yet. This is a ways down the road. We got to get them to listen first. Okay. The only way they're going to be willing to listen to you is if they think you might have something that's going to get them something they want. What's in it for me, right? That's the most important thing to anybody that you're talking to. Or help them avoid something they don't want. A call from an angry customer or their boss or HR <laughs> with their pink slip. Okay? So answer this question. What does your prospect want most and what does he or she want to avoid as it relates to logistics and transportation services? What do they want most? All right, this is a different spin, right? Then what do they want most? Most, They want to look good to their boss. They want to look good to their peers. They want to look good to the people that are sitting across from them. They want to look good for the next review, the next raise, the next promotion, right? Maybe they just want to look good because they want to get a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of... Uh, you know, uh, feedback from the, from the people in their organization. A little recognition, right? That's a huge one. 
You want to know the secret to winning somebody's heart, winning a customer's heart? Make them look good. Figure out a way at all costs to make them look good to their boss. Eek. It's very powerful. They want most. They want their job to be easier, less stressful. Absolutely. No question. Yeah. They want somebody reliable. We talked about that a little bit. Yeah. They want you to be responsive. Right? They want to know that you're accessible. That's a big one. Yeah. They want to avoid wasting time. Yeah, you're right. They're busy. Yeah, they want to avoid change for the sake of change. Right? They want to avoid change for the sake of change. Change is a, could be a four-letter word in some people's vocabulary unless it has significant benefit behind it. Right? It's easier to just keep the status quo than it is to take a risk and change, right? Once you figure out those pieces, and we've talked about them, hopefully you guys can jot it down some notes or you'll be able to catch it in the replay on this video, is once you have those wants and those want to avoids, those are the things you need to integrate into your opening. Those things right there are the things that you want to integrate and weave into your opening whether that opening be the first call or the third call or the tenth call. You want to integrate those pieces into your opening because just like the, you know, somebody's name is the sweetest music to their ears, what's in it for them is the most important thing that they want to talk about. Okay? So you want to really incorporate that into your opening. So the next section is, is titled How to Create in, to Create Interest Interest Interesting to How to Create Interest Every Time with Your Opening. I'm sorry. I wrote this and I can't remember what it says. So uh, here's, a, here's some ingredients or some strategies and tactics on how to create a compelling opening, okay? The opening is by far the most critical part of your call. Your opening must accomplish several objectives. It needs to, number one, identify you. Number two, let them know what's in it for them. We talked about that. Number three, it needs to get them involved. Okay? The same way as I'm trying to get you involved in this seminar, right? You need to get your, sale, you need to get your prospects involved in the conversation. If you're talking and they're just listening, you're in big trouble you're going nowhere fast because number one they're not listening okay they're half listening you'll probably hear them typing on the keyboard or talking to somebody else or you know if their phone clicks you'll hear them texting whatever they're doing they're not listening to you so you gotta get them engaged okay you gotta get them involved in in the process okay and remember your goal is not to sell or ask for a decision on this opening you are not trying to sell them or ask for a decision. Your goal is to put them in a positive frame of mind, move them to questioning. Selling or asking for a decision at this stage is a surefire way to turn them off. Okay? So this is a process. You play baseball, you get up to bat, you hit the ball, you can't run to second first. You can't run to third. You gotta touch first, then you gotta touch second, and you got to touch third, and hopefully you can come in home, right? Somewhere along the way, you may get thrown out. That's sales. That's how it works. But you got to touch first first. And this is the process. So you got to treat sales like it's a process, okay? And that's what I'm trying to share with you here. This is a process, all right? Next, uh, there's three key components. Talked about identify yourself. Secondly, let them know what's in it for them. This is by far the most important part, so answer these questions. There's three questions that you want to answer. What do your prospects want most in life? We've talked a little bit about that. What do they want most in life? What does your, do your prospects want? Not, now, you've got to think about it from two perspectives, the company and the person. Second, what do they want to avoid? And how are they the other third question is, how are they evaluated in their jobs? Carrie touched on that. She want, they want to look good to their boss. How are they evaluated in their jobs? Have you ever asked any of your customers how they're evaluated? 
Most salespeople won't. There's a process and there's probably some metrics of some sort of how a transportation or shipping manager is measured. Sure, new opportunities, new business for the company. Sure, that'd be a great idea. If a transportation manager came up with that, they'd probably get a big pat on the back for that. So reducing claims, so the claims percentage, right? They want to talk about what, what's their claims percentage and the dollar value of those claims. What else? On-time pickup, on-time delivery. What are some other metrics? Customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction, which is probably measured by repeat business, returns, complaints, right? Short pays on their bill, <laughs> employee turnover. Sure, employee turnover. If they have a group of people working with them, the employee turnover is a direct reflection of, uh, of, their, of their department. So I would urge you to ask that question of all your customers. Now, you've got to build it into conversation, okay? You can't just go out and say, you know, you've got you to be a little smooth about adding it in there. <laughs> but, you know, ask them, say, hey, when was the last, you know, a good way to do it. When was the last time you had a review? Oh, I haven't had a review in God knows how long. Well, do you, do they, is there any way that, you know, the company measures your performance? Well, yeah. All they care about is money. Well, how do they measure that? Can you tell me more. Well, what they do is they look at what we spent in this quarter last year or what we spent per mile on this or some metrics they're going to have for measuring spend, okay? Or per pound cost or some sort of per unit cost, okay? Ask that question. And then figure out a way to make them look good. If you can do that, it's huge. Huge, huge, huge. Answer those three questions and people will listen. Your answers need to be results oriented. So don't do the feature, benefit, advantage crap, okay? Um, there's a time and a place for that. It's not very often. Um, hopefully you're gonna get here in this next part a, a way to sell that's better than feature benefit selling. People buy results. So that should be in your opening, okay? Next, here's some opening examples, okay? Hello, Mr. Jones, I'm Joe Smith with Logistic Dynamics. I'm calling you today because we specialize in working with food and beverage companies and have been able to reduce their late pickups and deliveries to customers by up to 20%. Okay, now you're talking my language. What's the alternative? What do most brokers say? What's the, well, let's say the, You've all worked with different brokers. What's the worst opening you've ever heard? I'll tell you mine. I can save you money. I can save you money. Okay. That's not the worst. It's not, it's, not, it's not very good, but it's not the worst. What? Got any freight I can move? Got any freight I can move. That's right there on the bottom of the barrel. What else? What are you working on today? What are you working on today? Yeah, that's pretty weak. Yeah. You know what it is? It's lazy. That's what it is, it's just lazy. People don't wanna stretch their brains, they don't wanna think, they don't wanna be strategic, they just wanna, they just wanna be easy, they want it to be easy. It's not easy being successful in sales. I don't care what industry you're in, it's just not easy. If you're in the car industry, you know, if you're in the financial services industry, if you're in the software industry, you know, like a lot of our different backgrounds are, it's not easy. So don't try to make it easy. You can make it easier by being smarter, but it's not gonna be easy. But the key is don't be lazy. Another one is I'm calling today because we specialize in partial truckload and LTL consolidation and we've been able to save our customers upwards of 25%. Okay, you're talking my language, all right? There's, a weasel, there's some weasel language in there. It doesn't say guarantee, it says upwards to you know, that means up to, it might mean five, it might mean three, it might mean 15. But some of them have saved up to 25. I've got a, here's a really simple one that's better, that if you fall back to something other than, do um, you got any freight I can move or what are you working on today? <laughs> okay. Um, I got a few ideas I'd like to run yeah. by you regarding how we might be able to, that's an easy one. Use something like that. 
because if you're going to give some ideas, it means you're going to provide value, right? You got to give value. You got to provide the value add, okay? So those are some examples of, of some openings. <laughs>